many congratulations. Thank you so much. Because that's a profound film, to say the least. It's engaging, it's uh, deeply moving, and I'm sure it's going to throw up a lot of questions. I'm going to trigger this off with a few, and then we'll take questions from the house. I'd love to. With, uh, with the subject of this film, of Nirvashito, you've said somewhere that you didn't quite choose the subject, the subject chose you. Mm -hmm. Would you want to talk about that? Uh, I feel that uh, at any given point of time, uh, I am conditioned by a social setup, a political setup, and a mindset that I possess at that point of time. And that is what makes me feel like writing a certain thing, or read, reading a certain book, or even listen to some kind of music. So at the point that I took up Nirbashito, I think I was sort of ready for it, because I, uh, I was thoroughly engaged in uh, the writing process, and uh, it took a lot out of me when I was writing it. Uh, and at that point of time, I felt that I was ready to indeed make a film uh, to my liking, of course, uh, and that's when I decided to make Nirbashito. And while you were writing, were you sure that you would play the role of Not at the all. <laughs> Not at all, in fact. I did have other people in mind, uh, but uh, I passed the look test. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, there was the other thing, I mean, after uh, it was decided that I, I'd more or less go and play the role, uh, I realized that maybe having uh, lived with the character for so long, uh, I, it took me about a year and a half to write the entire script, the mm -hmm. various drafts of the script. Uh, it was, uh, it would have been quite easy for me to get into the uh, the persona of the person that I was trying to portray, because I would need somebody who was who had read Taslima's work. I would need somebody who was equipped to handle uh, the intellectual part of what she was all she is all about. And also, of course, sensitize the whole situation. I mean, be sensitive to the, situ the barrenness and the claustrophobia of banishment. Mm -hmm. So that I, I probably had imbibed in me by the time I had finished writing right. it. But it became a difficult job because even when I was working on a scene with, a, with my artist, or my co-act, I was looking at his performance and wondering, OK, I'll have to take, go, go for another take now. So you know, I was not uh, thoroughly into it as much as I would have liked. But maybe the homework earlier helped, all the writing earlier helped. Right. And that's quite a heavy task, actually, because it's mm. your debut direction <laughs> project. And such a such an important part, really. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it must have been a double yes. task. But as you said, the writing really is the process where you mm -hmm. begin to enter mm -hmm. the narrative. You begin to enter the subjects. Yes. And it uh, it, it starts there. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've also been living in Kolkata for all your life, I guess. And not all my life. Uh, but for most, uh, most for my of higher it. studies, and then yes. now. So yes. we belong to the same university. You're from <laughs> Jadavpur University. Yes. And you were there when uh, all these events really happened. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily follow things chronologically mm -hmm. in the film, but mm -hmm. you were there living the years when Taslima was brought back. Was sent back. away from Calcutta, yes. Uh, yes, and she was mm -hmm. sent away. And then the riots and, and the protests mm -hmm. and the demonstrations that mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. over and over again. And how, you know, almost in a sort of chronological fashion and in an uncannily predictable fashion, every book got banned, first mm. in Bangladesh and then in mm. the Bengali-speaking region mm. of West Bengal mm -hmm. in India. So you went through that, yes. and it was probably also a formative time when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. I had moved to Bombay by then, so I was mm. a little distance away, but then even then the entire narrative of mm. what was happening mm. constantly hooked you, mm -hmm. because you, know, you, you were into feminist discourse and you were interested in, feminist, in women's writing, and here you saw the persecution happening to mm -hmm. a woman who dared to say what she thought was right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily right for the society within mm -hmm. which she wrote. Mm -hmm. So you had religion on one hand, and you had uh, a patriarchal society on yes. the other. So she, yes. she raised her voice against mm -hmm. both. And mm -hmm. there were consequences which no one was really prepared for. Mm -hmm. what, what made you shape the script in, in this manner, that you actually start from a moment of leaving India or being forced to leave India? I feel that uh, 
just one small incident. Uh, this wasn't a small incident. It was a staged riot. But um, any small incident in a person's life can make uh, a whole lot of changes. Mm. You know, it's, it takes a moment to change one's life completely. And uh, that, I thought, the staged riot was the moment when uh, it was more or less a moment or when the riot was being staged, rather, was a time when it was decided that she would be sent out anyway. Mm -hmm. So that was more or less um, uh, the reason why I started the film with that point. And in fact, in one of my drafts, I uh, also have that caption, you know, when uh, a day when life changes uh, for, you know, uh, you never know how for how long. Yeah. Because she's still in exile. Mm -hmm. it's, but she's left, um, she was exiled from Bangladesh in 93, and this is 2015. And she was in Calcutta for some time. But then, well, the world accepts her, but the Bengali speaking world does not. People who read her books don't. And it is these books that are, I'm sorry, it is these books that are uh, so, that have become so important because they've been banished. You know, had they not been banished, I thought uh, they would have. Uh, reach the right places, mm -hmm. reach the right years, but uh, wouldn't have attained. Because I remember when the Khundito was banned, one of her, the sequels uh, in her autobiography, Autobi the series of auto autobiographies, mm -hmm. and it was released later, they just sold out. They just, you know, you couldn't get a copy of them because people were waiting to read what was in it. So actually by banning a book, you invite more attention. So I'm neither endorsing a thought, neither am I uh, saying that she's, you know, she could have said it differently. What I'm saying is that uh, you don't ban, you, you, you answer a book by a book. You answer a column by a column, not by banishing a person, not by putting a price on her head. But I think that's what happened to her and it has happened to many feminist writers around the world mm -hmm. who have been similarly persecuted. Mm -hmm. That, that the writing is really taken out of context and the mm. writing is not really important. The writer becomes a symbol mm. for larger forces, mm, mm, mm. Uh, the political forces, yes. or, or the sort of buying into a certain community or a vote bank, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we've seen happen mm. in Bengal. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the other part of your story, although mm. you have this deeply moving story of banishment of, of alienation, of exile, of a, woman, of a writer actually beginning to lose her creative powers because mm. she loses contact with her language and her mm -hmm. culture. But on the other side, you have this other story, the political story, yes. which is the, the entire treatment is different. It's, mm. it's, it's farce, it's, it starts with satire, and then it's farcical, yes. and then mm. it's, it's, it's absurd. You really bring it to the, the comedy of the absurd to a certain point. So were you really planning things this way? There are two completely different uh, treatments. See, there, there are two things. One is uh, I did want a uh, farce because I think uh, I said that the farce is a very strong satirical uh, statement. It's a very uh, strong way of putting a satire across. Uh, I mean, attacking the, uh, the forces, the, the support system is very easy to do. A poster drama is easy to make. So I did think that uh, the farce would work well for my film, A, because because a story of banishment and exile can be very one-sided in its mm -hmm. claustrophobic, uh, singularly claustrophobic uh, situation, you know? And I did want this uh, track to uh, amuse a little and make you think a little. So uh, that was one reason, A. And B, uh, Taslima actually has a, cat, uh, has a cat who she had to leave behind when she was sent away from Kolkata overnight. For those of you who aren't, mm -hmm. uh, who don't know about this, she was sent away from Kolkata overnight, and the cat, poor cat, stayed behind. Mm. By the way, the cat is with the mother now, uh, as of now, but she had to stay behind, and that I thought was heart-wrenching story because I have a pet Labrador myself, and they become like babies, uh, and they become insecure and uh, so upset when the mom is not there. So this thought, this uh, part of Taslima's life, of having left the cat behind, I thought I'd weave into an allegory, mm -hmm. where the cat, who's called Baghini, which means tigress in Bengali, is actually symbolic of the mother. So the cat, the people don't know what to do with the cat. The homelessness of the cat mirrors the homelessness of the mother. The fact that the cat yearns for the mother is Taslima's, or the writer's, yearning for the motherland, for the mother tongue. So I thought that it would, it would work also as an allegory, apart from amusing. Mm -hmm. 
So which is why I, I incorporated this bit, uh, this allegorical part into the script. Yeah, I must say it's worked superbly yeah. well. And, and your debut cat so. has, has performed so well. My indeed. cat, it's her debut performance. She's yeah. never been on, in a debut. film before. <laughs> and this is her first performance. She's the star of the show. <laughs> How I cried when I had to let her go after oh. the shooting was over. <laughs> I had to ensure that she got close to me because, uh, you know, she ha she'd have to be physically comfortable with me and my smell. So I handled her from the start. Even when I was directing scenes, I had her with me, uh, except when she was sleeping. And which is why you get the scene where, uh, you know, the woman is taken away and the cat sort of, you know, goes up, rears up. She, she you know, tries to look through the window. Uh, look through the window. She, she's upset. She doesn't know what to do. She goes up again. That was all, that all happened because the cat was genuinely attached to uh, me, you know, because uh, she didn't, she actually was, was wondering what, what, what went wrong. And there are no computer graphics in the film. All of it is the cat. There are no special effects. It's her all along. That is super. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <Mama. laughs> In fact, you have a whole sequence where uh, the cat remembers and the the nanny or the maid who's yes. walking away suddenly mm -hmm. transforms into the real the view of yes. the mother. Yes, yes. And then I was the first time I watched this. You you think okay, we talk about elephants having memory and dogs having memory, but a cat having a cats don't have very sequence. long memories. So yes. that's your imagination. But that's, cinematically, that it works, an, yes, so yes, well. yes. it works so well. That's where actually in that scene particularly, that's where she transcends from being a cat, only a cat, mm. to being also the mom, the human. Uh, person that mm. I'm, she's symbolizing. So tell us about the long sequences that you had in Sweden, because uh, the Swedish Film Commission obviously was involved with, mm -hmm. with the making of this film. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think of Bengali cinema or even largely in Indian cinema, Sweden has not really been cinematically represented for our audience at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, all, that's, yes. that's a huge achievement for you. So mm -hmm. tell it us was, about that. Yes, it was a lovely experience to start off with having uh, wreckied the places. Uh, and I actually wanted to uh, shoot in places where Taslima was uh, put in exile. Uh, one was Stockholm and one was uh, Easter Island. And I wanted to be true to those places, mm -hmm. so I wanted Stockholm only for uh, for Sweden only for my shoot. Uh, the recce went off well. The actors were very cooperative. I had sent them uh, scripts much uh, in advance before the recce. And I had told them that, you know, I want you for so and so, this role or that role. And I'll come in August. I'm going to recce. I'm going to audition you if you feel that uh, uh, this is okay to audition for. And I'm so glad they turned up in large numbers. And uh, they were very eager to know. And I think the script intrigued them. The banishment part of it intrigued them so because they had lots of questions to ask when they came. And I, um, I'm glad I got the uh, best uh, group of actors matched to perfection. Only Wilma, the woman who plays Wilma, Leah Boyson, she's the only one I did not uh, audition because uh -huh. uh, she came over, she met me, but I didn't, didn't audition her because when I had seen her show reel earlier, I knew this was my Wilma because that's the, exactly the, the kind of personality and the look I wanted for mm -hmm. uh, my Wilma. And she had great spirit. Yes, yes. yes. I and that sequence that. where you both, uh, where dance. she tries to make you dance mm -hmm. and then you'll go into this really, you know, fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an outburst from you, but yes. it's, it's, it's something radical being said again. It's orgasmic for the woman, yes. I think. Yes. yes. So, so that's quite, uh, quite stupendous, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have one more question before I open this up to the house. Have you met Taslima? Yes, of course. During the making of the, or uh, the writing, to, uh, or even uh, before? Before I uh, wrote my first draft, when I decided that I'd work on this subject, I got in touch with her over mail and uh, asked her whether it was okay that I worked on this. And she was, and I also said that I would use some of her poetry because mm -hmm. the poetry that I picturize here uh, are actually her voice. I mean, uh, I use the poetry to uh, bring out the more human side of Taslima that people generally tend to miss out. Uh, so I asked her for permission. She said, okay, write uh, and let me know. So then I wrote my first draft and uh, made an appointment with her. I went over to where she lives uh, in Delhi. She was in Delhi at that time. And I also wanted to meet uh, Minu, her cat, who's called Baghini. Uh, I went over and she was 
uh, okay with it. And uh, one of the poems, Barita Tui Achish Kamon, the poem about the house, the house, that was the poem that I incorporated after having met her. Uh, because uh, there, there, was, there was another very beautiful poem in that space. But she, uh, we were in, in one of those discussions, and she said, let me read out some poems to you. And this was one particular poem that she read out to me, and I thought it would be, you know, it would be so apt in that situation. So that is one poem that uh, I changed after having met her. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, I did meet her, and then I showed it to her after the film was uh, uh, made and complete, and that was a very emotional experience for both of us. She was pleased with what she saw. She was pleased and she was overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I, I, she said a lot, but I wouldn't want to say that myself. <laughs> it's, uh, she, was, she was overwhelmed. Well, I think it's important to have her at one of these and screenings. Just, I, I would interrupt you here. I was very emotional myself uh, because I was sitting next to the woman who I'd actually been living with for the last few years. You know, when I, because when you're writing, you're actually living the person. So she was there watching it, and there was this criticism of her, yeah. because the film is not necessarily an endorsement of what she no, says. No. So there's a lot of criticism, there's a lot of, uh, lot of her in it as well. And there were sequences that I had written, which she, uh, when she asked me in Bengali, to me, like, how did you know I went through exactly this, you know, I went through this in exile. How did you know? Because that's probably not there in her book. But I s sort of had gone into uh, her mind and worked it out that way. The, the walking scene, especially, you know, where she just, you know, can't ride and she walks out and the security people follow her. She said that I used to do it quite often. I just, just you know, walk out of the house. Mm -hmm. I couldn't bear to be held inside. So there were little things like this that uh, we connected beautifully. Mm -hmm. yes. I remember last meeting her in Stockholm, I think, and that's mm. when she precisely talked about this, this silence which was unbearable and and mm. the loneliness and the fact mm. that she couldn't converse because mm -hmm. you know her writing comes out of a culture where there is mm. where there are people there is sound mm. there is noise there is color right. and if you have one line in the film where she says I write better if there are people uh, around, around people. when she's being taken away yes. to the islands yes. mm -hmm. And also, you know, the evolution of language. A yes. language evolves uh, every day. And if you don't get to hear it being spoken, then you're out of touch with that language, which she says now is happening to me. She, she says that it's happening to her because uh, she can't hear Bengali being spoken. Yeah. And uh, she's stuck to a Bengali that she has heard and she imagines hearing. Uh, and that's about it. Or when she catches up with friends, perhaps. But to be in a milieu, to be in a situation where people speak the language, when you, when you belong to that culture, I think makes a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. And for her particularly, yes. Uh, yes. there are different sorts of writers, yes, but she's yes. a writer who needs that hmm. nurturing roots. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there is indeed, uh, I mean, freedom of expression is indeed threatened. And even uh, as I talk to you now, uh, we are not granted freedom of expression as much as most of us would like. Because uh, though there are laws uh, for it, for freedom of expression, because uh, uh, in March uh, this year, there was a Supreme Court ruling in India that uh, freedom of expression uh, was OK, I mean, on social media and other sites. So uh, the laws are there, but I think to put it into practice, because to, people are being threatened, people are dying for that even today. So until there's protection also, enough protection from the law, one could, can, cannot say that freedom of expression is, has become an, a right, you know, uh, which can be practiced freely and happily without being threatened by people who are lurking around to just catch you on the wrong foot. You know, with uh, this woman that I uh, write about, write, uh, who inspires me, that's Lima, there are volumes that can be said about her opinions and uh, volumes on what reactions they created. So I could given, never get to do enough. And now, you know, when uh, every information is available over the internet, I thought that uh, she is a global citizen and maybe people would access 
uh, the internet to know what uh, mm. she was all about. And I didn't want to oversee it like we n normally tend to do in movies like this, because uh, she's so much spoken of in our part of the world, you know? So that was one reason. I didn't want to so say it all over again. So that was one reason. And the other reason was I needed my part of the world to see the film. Had I been, you know, uh, making a biopic of her, uh, I wouldn't have my part of the world see the film at all. And that wouldn't serve the purpose of me making the film because I want thoughts on banishment. I want people to think on the point of exile in my part of the world, you know, specifically, because that is where the banishment is happening. That's where people are being uh, taken to task. So if my part of the world can't see the film, then it doesn't serve the social purpose that I believe in as a filmmaker. The decision of not using the name uh, happened because, see, this is not a biopic. Uh, a part of it is fiction. And uh, I mean, the, all the, uh, the subplot, the dealings with the cat didn't actually happen. So I, was not, would, I wouldn't be true to her story if I called the character Taslima. And if I couldn't call her Taslima, I wouldn't want to call her anything else. I would rather have her be the woman who repre represents free thinking and free expression, which is why I don't, you know, uh, sort of uh, box her into a name or a religion because she is against extremism anyway, of in any form belonging to any religion, which is why I also, you know, uh, when I uh, when I shot Gauri Pur, the the poem about the girl Gauri. If you remember, I didn't use any uh, baby a girl from Bangladesh or India. I used a girl from here who picks up apples in a basket, plays hopscotch. That's also because I didn't want to box her into any context because she did belong to India and Bangladesh, but she speaks for freedom of all women. And the, tr the transfer of innocence to experience happens with all girls. So it is that girlhood and the you know, uh, stripping of the girlhood that I wanted to portray in that film, in that uh, poem. So I didn't really actually have these boundaries in mind when I was making it.